I don't know whether it's true or not, but the story we heard at the time was that a, a gynecologist in France was doing a gynecological procedure, I guess, with, with the newer equipment, and he knew the patient had gallstones. And so he looked up at the gallbladder and wondered if he could take the gallbladder out, um, and which, uh, you know, seven hours later, uh, he did and said he'd, it was the stupidest thing he'd ever done. He'd never do it again, you know. But. In um, the fall of 1989, during the American College of Surgeons meeting, there was a presentation on laparoscopic cholecystectomy that caught a lot of people's um, attention. I said, yeah, I heard that some gynecologist in Germany is doing it, and it's a gimmick, and I think it's really like unsafe and stupid. But then at the uh, meeting of the uh, SSAT, in, uh, I think it was in San Antonio at the time in 1990, there was an abstract that came out by Carl Zucker, who uh, unfortunately has died since, but he was from University of Maryland and he had described in the abstract about 30 patients in whom he'd done laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So we were uh, a small group of people in 1990 interested in laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy. Harvey Sigmund and myself, we decided we're going to work at it on our own. So we had a lab organized for us, the two of us, and we were playing with the pig, learning how to use the instrument, the camera, etc. Uh, there was no training box at the time. I used a cardboard carton, I punched holes in it, bore the equipment, brought it up to this office that I'm sitting in, and uh, would put a plant in there and practice dissecting the plant. In February of 1990, I was on call one day, so I was on staff at that point, and I walked by this very office where Dr. Mulder used to be. He was the chair of surgery at the time. And I saw the light was on on a Saturday, and I said, oh, I wonder why he's here, you know? I wonder if there's a trauma or something. So I poked my head in the office to find out what was going on, and he was here with um, a surgeon from Germany by the name of uh, Hans Troidel, who was the chair of surgery in Cologne. And Troidel told me that he had started to do this new operation called laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And uh, he said, why don't you come to Germany, stay at my home, and I will train you to do this operation, and it will change your career, and it will change your life. Well, we learned about it uh, through Professor Hans Troidel from Cologne. He told us that we should come to Germany to learn how to do this new procedure. And uh, Dr. Fried was a, a keen young academic surgeon at the time, interested in anything new in GI surgery, and uh, he was very keen to go. I was chief of general surgery at the general, and I thought I should go to see if this is something we should incorporate into uh, our, uh, our surgical practice. I spent a week in Cologne. I went with another surgeon from here, John Hinchy, and um, we watched them do two laparoscopic cholecystectomies per day on four days. Uh, we were allowed, each of us, Dr. Fried and I, to take the gallbladder off the liver bed uh, after they had done the cystic duct and artery. So I came back and uh, spoke to Dr. Mulder and asked if we could get the equipment to start doing this operation. And uh, Dr. Hinchy and I did the first 50 cases together, so we scrubbed together. And then after that, we, st we each started to teach other people and then uh, eventually started to teach the residents and uh, so on and so forth. We at McGill set up probably one of the first training programs, an academic training program for uh, surgeons. And over a period of that next year, we probably trained about 120 surgeons right from right across Canada and Northeast the United States. The advice we gave to all of them was do not believe that because you've been here for 48 hours that you can now go home and do the operation. Find yourself a mentor, someone who can proctor you, and do the operation properly. The first patient we did was a patient of Dr. Sigmund, who knew she was number one. 
and she accepted all the risks. <laughs> So we did her, and it took a long time, about two hours, for a gallbladder, and it, it, it turned out beautifully. And I can remember finding that perfect patient and saying, this is a new operation, explaining very carefully, explaining how I would try to do with care, and I may have to open. And she looked at me, she says, that sounds very interesting, but I prefer you get experience than someone else. and." Uh, I'm going to go on a holiday for two weeks. I'm going to come back. Call me again. And so I then called her again, and she was the third patient, but she didn't want to be the first patient. I had a 21-year-old a model who um, I told before we went to Germany that I was going there to learn an operation that maybe would avoid a large scar. So uh, I went to the recovery room after at, when she was waking up, and I said, uh, you... Um, we did it, uh, we did it, and, and she said, she's kind of groggy, she said, the old way, and I said, no, no, the new way. <laughs> so she was very happy. The outcome of the patients was dramatic. When, you know, we would go to see them the next day, patients were walking around, they were eating, uh, like nothing ever happened to them, and then they would be sent home. There's something to this, because it's working. Patients are getting out of hospital, very quickly, complication rates seem to be low, and you know it's, it's a lot less painful than the old uh, standard incisions. Complications, for example, in biliary tract surgery, did not begin with laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is a different way of doing the procedure, and done well was safe. But I can tell you, on my thirteenth case, I had a common duct injury and uh, it was a real setback for me personally. You know, it was a, quote, easy case in a very petite woman, and I didn't realize that the size of her common duct was probably smaller than my cystic duct. And so I think I was a little cavalier, I think that's how. And I didn't recognize the injury in the operating room. I didn't know until 48 hours later when she called me and she very timidly, she was a nice girl, and she said, Dr. Weisglass, is it normal? I'm, I'm very yellow, and my urine is like tea. And my heart nearly stopped. Within a year of introducing lap coles uh, to this hospital, uh, if you didn't do lap coles, you didn't do cholecystectomies. They, it was just amazing how everything changed. Everyone was doing them. Everyone knew that they had to get comfortable with them. And, and as time went on, uh, I'd say within about 18 months, even those people who said, you know, it's just a fad, were starting to realize that it was here to stay. It also became a public demand that drove the operation. Patients would seek out those doing laparoscopic surgery as opposed to those who were not. And the interesting thing is that I don't think the same thing could happen today because it wasn't a tested technique. You know, there was no evidence out there. Uh, we didn't really know if it was such a great technique. After lap, lap coles kind of became routine, part of practice, the real excitement was, well, where do we go from here? When you have a technique that is so exciting, and has offered a lot of promise, <laughs> he, you know, he should not miss that opportunity. It also, here at McGill, uh, was a bonding uh, event. It helped to bring a lot of different groups who traditionally had not worked together, you know, come together under some really, you know, good leadership. You know, uh, it was just an exciting and very positive time here at McGill.